Wait, remember Lunatics Unleashed? It was the controversial, futuristic adaptation of the traditional Looney Tunes characters, but they're superheroes. Set in the year 2772, a group of super-powered individuals band together to protect the city planet of Acmetropolis. The intro to the series serves as a background to the series. A meteor hits the Earth, knocking it off its axis, resulting in the rise of six superheroes. Yeah, that's their origin story. That is all the explanation we get. I guess at that point, they were like, here's a fun, alternative idea to these characters we own the rights to. Oh, how do they get their powers, you ask? Uh, something space related. Yeah, just, just say something hit Earth and, and they got powers. <laughs> How? What do you mean how? I just told you how. A meteor hit the earth. That's how. When you change things that people already love, there's a big chance that you'll get a lot of backlash. This was the initial sentiment from Looney Tunes fans all across the world. Really just looking at this and going, who asked? But after all the dust had settled and time had passed, is the show really as bad as some out there claim it to be? Or is it a case of a show coming out too early? That may be pretty good on a look back. Did the changes that the creators made post-criticism to the series end up saving the show? And can someone please just tell me who unleashed them all. It's like asking who let the dogs out. Did we ever get that answered? I need to know because it's haunted me for nearly two decades at this point. I remember enjoying the show, but could that just be a case of my young brain enjoying whatever was on the screen? Or is my nostalgia for it warranted? So I thought it'd be fun to take a look back at Lunatics Unleashed, see if the cartoon holds up and learn about how it came to be as well as what happened to it. We had seconds, not hours, duck. Lunatics Unleashed was unleashed onto the world through Kids WB on September 17, 2005, and ran for two seasons, ending in May of 2007. Like I mentioned, we get our backstory within the opening intro to the show. A meteor crashes into the planet, causing the planet to shift its axis, as well as shooting out a supernatural energy burst that alters the genetic code of some of the people that live there, giving them superpowers, essentially. Of course, this leads us to our main group of characters who serve as a superhero team to protect the planet from various other threats. This group of anthropologists anthropomorphic crime fighters would be brought together by Zadavia, a pretty mysterious woman who shows up mainly in a hologram fashion and serves as the person in charge of the team, giving them their missions and overall just keeping them in line. With the team consisting of descendants of classic characters from the Looney Tunes, they live upon the skyscraper, so it's easy to draw in a lot of parallels to the Teen Titans franchise. Being a teenage superhero group, living in a tower with action that resembles similar situations as the Teen Titans, just with a way more futuristic twist from the powers that the group has to the endless amount of technology and gadgets at their disposal. The plan for the series was to match it to the action era of cartoons that were seemingly taking over most of the networks and capturing most kids' attention. Plus, it would be an easy entry into the toy market, right? With how often the Looney Tunes properly would adapt a form of their characters into a show that would fit in for the current times, it would make sense that this idea would have come about during this specific time. Make it snappy, chappy. We're about to save the city. The Tix Unleashed is coming right up, right here on Kids WB. Lunatics Unleashed, every Saturday morning at 9.30 on Kids WB. Our six familiar yet strikingly different main characters for the show include Ace Bunny, Lexi Bunny, Danger Duck, Tech E Coyote, Rev Runner, and Slam Tasmanian. I think it's pretty easy to tell the direct Looney Tunes character inspirations here. Ace Bunny, voiced by Charlie Schlatter, is the leader of the group who is pretty well suited for the job. He is mild-tempered and has an overall really cool and collected energy about him that is really reminiscent of the original Bugs. Also, like his great-great-grandfather, he is known for still having having a great comedic side, constantly poking fun at everyone around him. His superpowers include laser vision, optical enhancement, martial arts, and agility, which is kind of a callback to Bugs' agility to be one step ahead of his enemies, being able to have fun in any situation because he's like that invincible. Lexi Bunny is the descendant of Lola Bunny. She is voiced by Jessica Diceco. They do a good job at making her character stand pretty tough on her own. She's not used as a vessel to pair up with anyone and expresses her own personality, interests, and abilities. She is a fan of fashion, video games, and music. Her powers are not only limited to super hearing, she also has chlorokinesis, the ability to control plant life, and is an incredibly skilled acrobat. Next to Ace, she is portrayed as another huge leading figure of the group and is also one of the most essential members in a fight. Danger Duck, voiced by Jason Marsden, is very close in attitude to Daffy Duck. He is always preoccupied with the fame and glory that comes with his job, but satisfyingly, for me at least, is never praised for the work that he does, and is actually often 
and harshly critiqued or excluded by their supervisor, Zadavia. He is slimy and arrogant, but oh so lovable. His powers are probably the most powerful and the most out of pocket of the group. He has something called the Power Orb Randomizer, which is basically just the ability to create and attack an enemy with flaming energy spheres. He also has a teleportation ability, which could be a reference to Daffy Duck's ability to his spats of sporadic and fitful episodes whenever he would get particularly excited or angry. So all in all, the coolest superpowers of them all. Maybe it's a good thing that everyone humbles him so frequently. Tech E. Coyote is voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson, who, unlike his ancestor Wile E. Coyote, Tech is incredibly intelligent, actually more so than Rev Runner. His technology offers the team a lot of really cool tech and interesting inventions that makes it very achievable to fight and defeat villains of various magnitudes. His very big brain way of speaking can sometimes only be understood by Rev, which leads to their naturally strong friendship and ability to partner up in inventing things. Other than a big brain, his powers also include the ability to manipulate electricity and magnetic fields, as well as regeneration. The latter is another really cool callback to the original cartoons in which Wily's plans would literally blow up in his face, but he would be back in one piece a minute later. Rev Runner is the descendant of Roadrunner, voiced by my favorite voice actor in the business, Rob Paulson. Rev obviously has super speed, and of course, his personality has to live up to that. He talks a mile a minute and is also incredibly intelligent, which, as I mentioned earlier, is important in his relationship with tech. Rev's additional powers include flight, possible through his super speed, enhanced strength, and global positioning, which is basically like he has GPS built right into his head. This type of psychic thinking also contributes to his ability to see briefly into the future, which he uses to avoid crashing into things. The last of the group is Slam Tasmanian, who functions as the brawn, but doesn't have that much of a personality. A descendant of the Tasmanian Devil, Slam is also voiced by Kevin Michael Richardson. Well, I guess voiced really isn't the right word, so I'll just say that Richardson more provides various forms of grunting, which we aren't meant to understand. Although it doesn't sound like Slam is speaking any kind of language, the other Looney Tunes are able to understand him quite well, and often provide much needed translation for his dialogue. A lot of his interests are more so, mentioned by the group, like eating a lot and uh, eating a lot. Much like Great Great Grandpa Devil, Slam can also go tornado mode. And don't just come to conclusions, even though he seems to be more bronze than brains, he shows a lot of understanding and affinity to battle strategies. Now like we briefly talked about, Zadavia is this pretty mysterious figure who gives the lunatics their objectives and is the puppet master of their operations, but becomes the sole reason for why the lunatics are even here in the first place. We find out her mysterious past in relation to the meteor with her being an alien and causing the meteor to hit the planet where it did but only doing so as if she didn't, it would have hit the planet in a different location at a different speed that could have been cataclysmic to the whole planet, rather than just changing the axis of the planet. It's a cool revelation that adds a lot of lore to the show, explaining a bit more of the brief intro explanation that we got. However, along with her character in general, the show would make some serious changes going into its second season, from the tone of the show and the direction of the show. Now, the show would go through these changes for its second season based on a number of factors, but even before the show started, it was already causing a stir. The series was met with a lot of backlash from fans after the first look at the series was released. Fans didn't have a lot of background of what the series was meant to be, inciting a lot of panic on the behalf of fans thinking that this was going to be a reimagining of the original characters that would act as if they were replacing the original designs, voices, and attitudes. The first look promotional trailer starts with a man in Warner Brothers Studios inking a drawing of the traditional six characters, Bugs Bunny, Lola Bunny, Daffy Duck, Tasmanian Devil, Roadrunner, and Wile E. Coyote. After he leaves in a rush due to a news broadcast explaining that a meteor will hit Earth, knocking it off its axis, an ink jar spills revealing a darker, different look at the characters and their new superpowers. It was not specified that these new characters were the great-great-grandchildren of the iconic characters that we all grew up with. It was supposed to be a whole new generation with just a nod to their original classic inspirations. What's up, Doc? But obviously, that teaser didn't lead you to interpret it that well. And I mean, when you have news reports showing the designs of the new characters to children, and they call it the Evil Bugs Bunny. What do you think, Kenny? Uh, that's the Evil Bugs Bunny thing. Preferring the standard look of Bugs over the new sleeker Bugs-like character, that's not the best hope for your show doing well, even if your main targeted demographic was aimed a bit older. An 11-year-old fan named Thomas created a website to petition the redesign, and it received a lot of attention. SaveOurLoonyTunes.com was an instant attention grabber receiving over 200,000 signatures and 5,000 email responses from fans who also supported Thomas's opposition. He said his main problem with the new concept
concept was how they looked. They didn't have any pupils and their figures became more jagged and harsh. Not to mention the line that Ace Bunny says at the end of the preview doesn't have his iconic Brooklyn accent, which I have to admit was very jarring to me. And I'm not even the biggest Bugs Bunny fan. I mean, I'm a fan, but not like a super fan. Another one of Thomas's fears was that they would put more funding into the lunatics instead of the classic cartoons. From the network's perspective, a lot of the initial pushback just comes from the territory of trying to make something new out of the tools they already had in their tool belt. It's just part of the territory when you change something that people are comfortable with. So their intentions with making the art style and voices completely new was because they had to commit to something different enough that it wasn't jarring to viewers. The main reason for all of the backlash was because they didn't preface the intense tonal shift by clarifying it's a completely new generation. Once that was clarified, a lot of that hatred towards the new characters died out. Also, the slightly tweaked and softer character designs did help too. Honestly, I am happy that they have pupils now. They wanted to make the series more like other Warner Bros. superhero series like Batman and Teen Titans, with its visuals and darker, action-packed fight scenes. For the second season, based on both the declining viewership and feedback from parents not being into the look and tone of the show for their children, they decided to change up the formula a bit, mainly noticeable in its lighter tone for the lunatics themselves and the problems that they deal with, filled with more jokes and less aggressive action sequences, along with the introduction of legacy character descendants making appearances, mainly as villains for the lunatics to deal with, and some legacy characters just showing up for the heck of it. These decisions were made in hopes of bettering the show for their audience, but they initially set out to make a show for an older demographic. So now no longer having a clear vision of who you are marketing your show towards ends in both demographics not tuning in. No pun intended. What up, Doc? The Lunatics! Let's get a All new Lunatics Unleashed right now on Kids WB. The future is wild. Some of my critiques of the show are actually minimal, just a few nitpicky things. For one, it feels kind of lonely. There are really no other animal characters shown in the world that we explore, and it seems kind of jarring. In one of the scenes where we learn about Tech's background, we see his failed university thesis project blow up in his face, disappointing his human professor. We initially only see the outlines really emphasizing that this is the only anthropomorphic coyote, with a human professor at a school where his peers are most likely human students. Like, I'm assuming he had to go to previous schooling before this, taking standardized tests, and just existing more in a human world. Whereas initially, there was a huge degree of separation between the lunatics and the humans. It would have been really cool if they went the route that gargoyles did by showing their interactions, both positive and negative, with humans. They do have their human-like alien overseer, Zadavia, but other than that, it feels like there's so much to be explored about the lunatics and their relationships with the world, the humans, and each other. But each episode exclusively focuses only on the task at hand which is usually the constant eminent threat of supervillains. Speaking of the supervillains, none of them are really that memorable. It's a villain of the week setup. Although in the second season, we see some more versions of past Looney Tune characters like Elmer Fudd with his descendant Electro J. Fudd and Sylvester the Cat with his descendant Silt Vester. Running for two seasons with 26 total episodes, the initial feedback was really positive. It constantly held the top spot in its second week of airing, but the success didn't last long. The series quickly went down downhill with viewership and the network admitted that it was because parents hated it. They saw it as too dark with mohawks and menacing eyes. The futuristic Looney Tunes hybrid was not a success. In fact, a New York Times article shares that the framed art from Lunatics Unleashed is hanging in the offices at Warner Bros. Animation Studios specifically to serve as a reminder of what they should not attempt to do again. Now that's kind of harsh and kind of hurt to read because I actually had a lot of fun with the series. Sure, with the second season feeling a bit different from the first in tone, there are some definite issues with my overall enjoyment of the show. But it was great to see all of the characters working together as a big family offering similar vibes to Teen Titans. But the precedent of Lunatics Unleashed as a failure of a series with a never again attitude is just the final nail in the coffin. It seems very unlikely that we'd ever see these characters or an attempt to make something similar ever again. There are some petitions out there of fans who would love to see the series come back again. So there is still a fan base for this series who enjoyed the show for 
for what it was. I think as people get a chance to revisit it, they will probably enjoy this fun take on a familiar property. Sure, today there is more superhero fatigue than ever before, but also I do see this show as making the right moves, but at the wrong time. Sadly, this happens more often than one would think. I love that each of the main characters have a basic color scheme. It made each of them stand out a bit more and I just love Rev's look the most. If this show had more time to develop the style and humor of the second season onto a third season and beyond, the show could have found a rise in its audience, but it's a little too late for that unfortunately. At least they aren't afraid to make jokes in other future shows regarding Lunatics Unleashed, taking it on the chin, with the new Looney Tunes show from 2015 making a joke about the appearance of what a modern Bugs Bunny should look like, as well as making a joke in Teen Titans Go about the reboot of the Lunatics showing a poster of the show along with a scream of terror, and even most recent in the Animaniacs reboot with most of the characters making a cameo in the series, just to be made fun of as no one knows who they are. But what do you think about the show? Have you gone back and given it a chance? Or maybe you originally watched it back then and have some thoughts on the series? Let me know below in the comments. Thanks so much for watching, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe with notifications on for more content like this, and I'll be back with another video soon, but until then, later.